Um, okay, so our next uh, presentation is going to be a reading from the uh, books, three-part series books called Murder Incorporated, Empire, Genocide, and Manifest Destiny. And the authors are Mumia Abul-Jamal and Stephen Victoria. I'm just going to read a little bit about them here. Uh, Mumia Abul-Jamal is an internationally celebrated Black writer and radio journalist, author of six books and hundreds of columns and articles. He's an organizer and inspiration for the prison lawyers movement, former member of the Black Panther Party, and supporter of Philadelphia's Radical Move organization. He has spent the last 30 years in prison, almost all of it in solitary, solid, solitary confinement in, on Pennsylvania's death row. Millions of people in this country and around the world believe Mumia is innocent, and of course I do. Stephen Victoria is a film director and producer. His documentary films include Long Distance Revolutionary, A Jury with Mumia I was so emotional, <laughs> uh, but a great film and One Bright Shining Moment, The Forgotten Summer of George McGovern. He has also co-authored with Mumia this new three-part series titled Murder Incorporated, Empire, Genocide, and Manifest Destiny. Rachel. Thank you. And um, we have an endorsement um, from them, and I'm going to read that and then introduce our reader. So um, Stephen Vittoria says, Mumia Abul Jamal and I were honored to include two passage or passage from our Murder Incorporated book series. We're only reading one here. We'll uh, post the other one. The importance of the Cold War Truth Commission can be found in two places. First, right in their very name, truth, offering sanity to a truly insane chapter of history. Secondly, more truth, found in the hearts of the folks who have undertaken this invaluable project. And our reader today will be Alexis Green. She is a California State University Chico alumna from Los Angeles. She is currently on a mission to write, illustrate, and distribute educational coloring books as the founder of AJG Books, a graphic design and book publishing service. All right, can, ev can everyone hear me? Yes, perfect. Yes. So good afternoon or evening, good evening everyone. So as Ms. Brunke said, my name is Alexis Green. I'll be reading an excerpt from Murder Incorporated Empire, Genocide, and Manifest Destiny by Mumia Abu Jamal and Stephen Vittoria. A segment from book three, Perfecting Tyranny, chapter six, Stasi 2.0. Citizens commissioned to investigate the FBI. On 8 March, 1971, 110 miles away from Media, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier were pummeling each other in Madison Square Garden. The eyes of the world were focused on the fight of the century, but that evening in media, a, a sleepy Hamlet residence called everyone's hometown, a daring break-in was underway at a small FBI field office. More than 1,000 classified break, oh, sorry, 1,000, more than 1,000 classified documents were retrieved by a small group of passionate American citizens who were active in both the civil rights and anti-war movements, ardent dissenters against the, wa uh, the wanton murder in Southeast Asia, as well as the domestic terrorist actions underfoot by a U.S. intelligence community hostile to the recently slain MLK civil rights, black liberation, as well as other groups fighting for justice. This tight group known as the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI knew it was time to do, some, to do more than protest. As Ali peppered Smoke and Joe with a barrage of stinking jabs and Joe countered with the historic left hook that sent the Louisville lip crashing to the canvas, the Bureau's malfeas malfeasance, malfeasance and corruption was about to be revealed by eight activists who broke into the tiny FBI office and gathered up every document they could find. Among the documents, reports doc Democracy Now! was one that bore the mysterious word Cointel Pro. One of the activists slash burglars, John Raines, acknowledges the group's 
the group consisted of whistleblowers before whistleblower had entered the lexicon. He also knew citizens had to do something bold, something intrepid. Yes, something intrepid because Hoover, besides being diabolical, was also untouchable. He had presidents who were afraid of him, Reigns explains. Nobody was holding him accountable and that meant somebody had to get objective evidence of what his FBI was doing. Get their files and get what they're doing in their own handwriting. At the time, Betty Metzger, Metzger was a reporter for the Washington Post. Shortly after the break-in, she received the cache of documents from Liberty Publications with a letter from the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI explaining when, where, when, and why the stash of evidence was collected. Metzger was shocked and stunned by the trail of criminal behavior perpetrated by the Bureau, and it quickly became apparent to the reporter that Hoover's FBI was especially fond of conducting, quote, blanket surveillance of African-American people, unquote. The documents detailed surveillance programs in nearby Philadelphia, as well as various national programs. The documents also revealed that the illicit spying and counterintelligence was ubiquitous throughout the community. Churches, classrooms, stores down the street, just everything. In fact, the FBI was grooming informants in every walk of life, all of them targeting domestic dissenters. The revelations also exposed the FBI's directive to, quote, enhance the paranoia, unquote, of anti-war activists through harassment, intimidation, rumors, lies, and, and installing agent provo pro provocators everywhere. The surveillance, quote, the surveillance was so enormous, unquote, explains Metzger, that it led various people, the various people rather sedate people in editorial offices and in Congress to compare it to the Stasi, the dreaded secret police of East Germany. The eight media whistleblowers protected their anonymity for more than 40 years, forcing the press and public to focus on the substantive content, substantive, substantive <laughs> content rather than the worn out and predictable debate over whether the burglars were treacherous well, no, treasonous or not, as was the case with Daniel Ellsberg and the release of his Pentagon Papers just three months later. On that fateful night, Frazier narrowly beat Ali. And while the two warriors nursed their wounds in a building anchored between 7th Avenue and 34th Street, each of eight other warriors set up shop in a Pennsylvania farmhouse and dropped a dime on the Bureau's ugly and illegal operation. The exposure of Hoover's massive and secretive COINTELPRO hijinks, along with his iniquitous violations of civil, civil liberties, helped pave a way for the notable church committee headed by Senator Frank Church of Ohio, uh, bleh, Idaho, <laughs> that investigated the entire spectrum of US intelligence operations. In fact, the church committee's damning report triggered various congressional intelligence oversight committees, including the House Select Committee on Assassinations, as well as the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, or FISA, which as we've seen, sort of, kept US surveillance in check for a short time. As expected, control by FISA waned as the various agencies kicked back, and then the subsequent reform, me reform measures dramatically dried up with the election of Ronald Reagan. But on 8th of March in 1971, in the quiet suburbs west of Philadelphia, eight courageous men and women with ice in their veins decided to hell with civil obedience and put everything on the line in an audacious move to alert their fe fellow citizens that treachery was underfoot. In a move that defined self-sacrifice, these eight unexpected swashbuckling activists bring to mind the essence of William Kunstler's words when he spoke of the tragedy, courage, and death at Kent State University. So these were his words. 
The four who died here, the nine who were wounded here, they did more for their country than all the Nixons and the Agnews, Agnews, I believe, and the Reagans could possibly do. End excerpt. Thank you, Alexis. Mm -hmm.